and welcome to the Rehydrate interview series, a forum for discussion of Lucy Shin's Remembrance of Earth's Past series. Each episode, I'll be speaking with a guest about their thoughts and experiences on reading the series. Spoiler warning for listeners, this episode will contain spoilers for all of the three-body problem, the dark forest, death's end, and any other media that we happen to discuss. My name is Dan, and today I'm joined by Gilmez. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm very good. I'm excited to talk about the books. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, let me hear a little bit more about yourself. Uh, myself, my name is Yomaz Aiten. As you can see, I live in New York. Um, I'm 33 years old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm an estimator for an architectural firm. Um, so I guess you could say I have a bit of a STEM background, although nothing compared to what you would describe the education as of many of the characters in the books are, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, having that sort of analytical mindset along with just, you know, general nerdy, uh, predispositions kind of made me fall in love with this series right here. Yeah, I think that's true. I'm, I'm a software engineer myself. And I think, yeah, having that sort of like analytical mind, like scientific, more thinking mind, like it helps you like get, mm -hmm. I think be more immersed in that story and like be more open to the big scientific concepts that either introduces. Exactly. Because this isn't very much so. I mean, Sisson's not really known for being a character development sort of author. If you've read any of his other stuff, such as Ball Lightning or Wandering Earth, it's more the scientific uh, uh, awe and wonderment that mm. drives his narratives more than characters per se. But now that that's not to say that he neglects characters entirely, which is which would be a fallacy. He doesn't. He just doesn't lean on that as his prime driving force in telling the story. Right, right. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Um, so what, what got you into the, the series? Like, how, how, how did you hear about it? Like, what, what drew you to wanting to, to read it? This series specifically was recommended to me by a couple of friends. Um, every so often, we don't have like a book club, but we would try and coordinate what we're reading. So we have something to talk about in group chat. Um, mm -hmm. And we've read a few other modern uh, science fiction books. Um, the uh, Children of Time, Children of Ruin. Uh, I guess it's not a trilogy yet, but it seems like it will be. The uh, Quantum Magician would be another one, which is more of a comical than a hard science uh, series, and a few others. So yeah, it's really just uh, word of mouth, I guess, to answer your question. And then how did you actually read it? Did you read like a physical copy of the book, an ebook? Yeah, so I have the three physical copies, and it was... Um, it took me over the course of like three to four months because um, mm. I'm kind of a slow physical reader. I guess just the tracking speed tires me out, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm actually going through it again, but this time in Audible. Um, so I, the reason I discovered this podcast was um, through the subreddit, um, Three Body Problem. Mm. Um, and I was going through, uh, I was just on Reddit one day and it was one of the suggested subreddits because I guess, you know, tracking your cookies or whatever it's seen sometime <laughs> in my past i was interested in the book so it suggested it and i was like oh yeah i loved it and uh yeah so i, I just restarted listening to the first one three body problem a few days ago on audible awesome yeah actually like that's the the way i first read the the first book was was on audible mm -hmm. um i i am a big podcast listener and i just needed something to listen to on a long drive yeah. and i was like yeah. looking for recommendations <laughs> you know uh so a couple of my friends, the same ones that put me onto this book originally, they're kind of audible or ebook haters, mm. uh, <laughs> kind of elitists in the sense where they feel like, oh, you don't extract um, the same appreciation or uh, you don't put in the work, so to say, <laughs> yeah. in a book. But I remember reading this, um, I forget where it was from, but it was a scientific uh, journal entry where someone pretty much proved that reading and listening to a book there's no discernible difference in what you intellectually extract from it the only difference is you're tiring your eyes out by reading mm. uh, <laughs> i could link that to you later on yeah definitely um yeah i feel like when i so so when i listened to it i don't think i didn't absorb it as much because like i wasn't super focused on it i think that's the difference with uh with audible mm -hmm. books like you now it's driving like you know paying attention right. to the road and like then your mind starts to wander and like oh yeah i'm listening to a book right but with mm -hmm. a book like i think you need to be more to me anyway i need to be more focused and like it and it's easier to kind of catch 
um, some of the more details, especially like when they get into like names and that kind of mm-hmm. thing. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, to me, it's easier to focus and, and concentrate. I understand where you're coming from and I feel the total opposite. <laughs> I feel like when I'm driving, especially, so I have a bit of a long commute. I drive an hour each way. Mm. Um, I'm able, and if there's no traffic, that's kind of the key. If there's no traffic, I could kind of turn my brain off to the traffic and kind of coast a bit. It it, it sounds more dangerous than it actually is. <laughs> and just listen to the book. Whereas if, you know, I'm laying in bed, reading the book, my eyes kind of wander mm. and I'm not like, you know, mm. comprehending what I'm reading. Um, So that's why I think books like these, I think, at least through the first couple of chapters of Three Body Problem, um, I seem like I'm grasping better. Now, that just could be the the narrator being cued in to what perhaps is being lost in translation Hmm. better than I can read. I don't know if the narrator himself is the translator, Um, Ken Ken Liu. I don't think he is. I don't remember. Um, that's something I could look up. But either way, um, I feel like I'm extracting more information. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I guess of the three books uh, of the series, like which one is your favorite? Mm, that's, uh, I feel like there's n- not really an answer to that question uh, because I I read it, I went th- through it, I guess you could say, um, after all three came out. And I didn't stop in between each story, each book rather. Oh, so yeah. for me, it's one it's one continuous story. So to to like put a delineation point in between where you know Dark Forest ends and Death's End begins would be arbitrary to me. Yeah. yeah. Um. But I guess if you put a gun to my head and was like, you got to answer this question, <laughs> I I would say Death's End would be my favorite out of the three because okay. it's the culmination of everything and it's where the scope is, you know, zoomed out the furthest. So you see the full consequences of everything that occurred over the past, you know, several hundred years in the narrative. We could get into the details later on in this, I I imagine. Yeah. So I I guess like, I mean, that makes sense that, you know, you read it as one contiguous story. Um, Mm -hmm. So I guess like in that, in that vein, like what are the moments that kind of stick out to you? Like the big moments, like when you think about the series, like at a really super high level, like, Mm-hmm. That moment was some of my, these are some of my favorite moments from the, the series. Um, well, you, of course, have the, each book has its, you know, climax, its culminating event, which in each three respective books is a, a wondrous, cinematic, and awe-inspiring moment. Um, the first one, bef- so put your mind in, Put yourself in your mind when you're reading the first book, right? And you have no... Try and you, try your best to forget the Dark Forest and Death's End. At the end of Three Body Problem, when they set up that the towers with the wires to cut up the ship, hmm. can you think of anything in your recent memory of stuff you read that was as crazy as that and that would be as wild uh, if it was made into a television uh, scene or a movie? Yeah. Um, and I guess the, uh, I suppose the equaling moment in the dark forest would be, you know, the the teardrop cutting through the fleet, yeah. and then death, and then death send the the painting of the solar system. But but yeah. those are the awe-inspiring cinematic moments. You're asking me what my favorite moments were. So yeah. it's a it's a bit more of a very nuanced and personal question. Um, <laughs> I think something that Sisson does very well is he veils the mystery and antagonists that you think are the baddies of the story end up not being the ultimate baddie. <laughs> hmm. um, something I feel that, that does that very well would be, uh, are you much of a gamer? Yep. Yep. So I don't know if you've ever played the, um, sort of the golden age of Final Fantasy games from the PlayStation era. So oh, yeah. 7, Perfect. 8, and 9. Yeah, so like sure. in, each, in each one of those games, the original you know, antagonizing force isn't the ultimate antagonizing force. Right. Um, and that's something he does very well. So in the first book, you know, you think it's uh, this anti-science, anti-intellectual threat in society um, that we're kind of seeing a lot of today. Mm-hmm. You think that's sort of where the the theme of the story is going as not at all um in the second book uh dark forest 
So that that's further back in my memory. So I'm trying to recall exactly what was going on. There's so much going on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like Dark Force is like kind of bifurcated too, right? Because like you have like the first half is like all about the wall, the, the right, 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 projects and that kind of stuff. And then it's like totally separate. Like after after the teardrop attack, then then it's <laughs> then it's all that, that. Yeah. So so yeah. Now it's coming back to me drip by drip, and I remember thinking for a large portion of the, the Dark Forest that um, Luoji was the bad guy, and in many, you know, to many people, he remains the bad guy with his nihilism and his selfishness. Um, mm -hmm. So part of me was anticipating the big reveal that, oh, he was working with the tri all along, but that ended up not being the case. Um, you know, you put your spoiler uh in the beginning so yeah <laughs> yeah all, all, all three all open spoilers no no uh no yeah yeah <laughs> so that but but in my mind like that's what it was being set up as another false antagonist and in death's end you had uh, uh i guess you could say what's uh chang chang oh chang Xin. chang Xin. yeah i guess you could say for a while that she was the antagonist because she knowing her own limitations and faults she still chose to be the sword holder um and it's a very if you understand i could i, be, I could be getting this wrong if you understand that you lack what it takes to execute the job why take the job right yeah she had and, no intention of ever pressing that button <laughs> right and the tri Solarans knew that all along they had their algorithms you know, suss out the uh, dispositions and inclinations of Luoji for decades before that. And they knew, like, I forget what the statistic was, like 95% chance that if they struck that he would press the button and have right. both their systems blow up. And then oh, they right. did it on her. And I don't remember what the numbers were, but I don't know, say for argument's sake, it was 50%. And they were like, you know, what? we could take that gamble. Right, and she right. and she knew that herself because who knows you better than yourself. So I guess back to your original question: What was my favorite? What was my favorite moment? My singular favorite moment. I think it it might be right when the uh, deterrence era became the post deterrence era, and and they handed the remote over and the trice mm -hmm. I'm Like, all right, that's it. Immediately, it was like I remember it was within a within a paragraph that they yeah. attacked. I thought that was, I think that not only vindicated Luoji's theory all along, but it also, there, there's finally real consequences for Earth for everything that happened. Right, right. Up until that point. Because up until that point, the only loss that Earth ever felt was the destruction of those ships. But that's something that Earth could recover from. From that point forward, it was, rapid decline for all humans yeah were, really rapid <laughs> right there were yeah it, all the australia stuff <laughs> all the the imprisonment there and the, they were treated like cattle um yeah. and then after that the two ships that left the solar system was a blue space and and the bronze age yeah i yeah blue space i forget the other one but yeah there's three of them right and the blue uh, space bronze age and uh uh oh gravity gravity Gravity, that's right. They sent the, the signal out because they had the gravity antenna. Right, right. And then soon after that, the Trisolaran system was destroyed. And then soon after that, the solar system was destroyed. But yeah, from that point on, it was all downhill for people. When you when you think back on reading the three body problem for the first time, um, when you first read it, like, did you have any sort of idea what it was about? Um, were you surprised by the beginning of it? Like, personally, like the reason I asked is because I personally was very surprised. Like, I picked up this book because it was like, or you know, I picked up the audio book because it was hard sci-fi, and then it's like they mm -hmm. started to talk about the cultural revolution, and like, then mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like, what's going on here? So, like, I guess did you have a similar experience? Uh, did I go into it um, expecting anything? Well, I knew. It's genre. I knew it was a sci-fi uh, space epic, um, just from basic description from my friends. Um, what I expected was probably along the lines of another space opera that uses outer space as the vehicle to deliver a sort of uh, a moral message to the audience. 
another story where space is used as the backdrop for lecturing the audience, the reader, about how they should behave and what a bad person they are. But it was totally different from that. And I read a lot. I consume a lot of media, movies, music, television. So I guess I'm kind of very well indoctrinated and kind of jaded to Mm. Western style of writing. Um, When I'm watching TV, I find myself predicting the very next line that comes out of a character's mouth more often than not. (laughs) <laughs> it becomes kind of monotonous. Um, Sisson coming from China, of course, um, coming from a place that up until very recently, there weren't very many cultural exports. It's refreshing. It's it's not it's a novel novel, right? right. Um, so I I thought I knew what I expected, but what came of it was something totally different. Very, I guess, in the ultimate end, you could say, you know, how the narrative played out that it's rosy, it's peachy with the pocket universes and everything kind of resetting and, oh, look, you know, our if we stay the course with our virtues and morality, you know, you know, things would be great, but not great for all the civilizations and people who died along the way. So it's a very, mm-hmm. it's a very grim and sobering and humbling story something that you don't see very often from western writers yeah i would say yeah because it shows us like how insignificant we are right not even mm-hmm. like in the scope scope of like our our solar system or you know or, i mean our our uh you know, like the milky way right but like of in course. the entire universe like we're so insignificant there's like millions of these races like always fighting and like we're just like some people out there like sending some naive message into space like hey look at us <laughs> you know you yeah. should come, come visit us right <laughs> we're so insignificant that the chapter where Singer was loading up his uh, interstellar rail gun. Right. <laughs> he, so hit him and his niche in his society is considered to be a lowly job. Like he's just some pencil pushing, you know, right. entry level job. That's how insignificant we are, that our destruction is just like, whatever, dude, why are you emailing me about this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Blow him up. <laughs> He did think we were sort of interesting by, you know, yeah. calling us star fuckers and everything, it, but it's like, yeah, it's more like curiosity, but like, yeah, whatever. And the it, boss is like, I just, just, just do it. You know, I, I respect uh, Ye Wen Jay because if not for her, the singers wouldn't have thought of us enough to hit us with their level two attack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at least we had that respect from uh, this type three, maybe type four civilization. Whatever the hell they are. Oh, there was a. <laughs> I remember there was a sentence in that paragraph that that stuck out to me, um, where he said that where he they, uh, the author alluded to Singer and his race's ability to put himself in the minds of other people, where he can like, I guess, transpose his consciousness or something. Oh yes, yeah. someone else mentioned that too. Um, that the the his boss or you know the, the, his supervisor could like read could like read his thoughts, right? And like mm-hmm. that was more open. And I think it's like similar to like the, how the Tresselarians can't hide their thoughts. Like did they just transmit yeah. them, you know outside of their body? So I think it's a, I think those chapters like are some of the more most interesting ones uh, mm-hmm. where they actually talk about from the perspective either the Tresselarians or or Singer, yep. uh, because like the way he talks about time, it's like they talk about light minutes or like green right. sand. Like this is his writing style is very interesting there. I think. The the P, the non Earth POVs were amazing. Um, yeah, I think it, his ability to so we're humans, right? We can't we can't describe an alien society or alien mindset at all because we're not alien by definition. It, it would be impossible. But right. he does as good a job as any at putting himself out of his taking himself out of his own shoes and trying since in a very sincere way to suspend disbelief but in a very plausible way of what another civilization might might be there's a lot i feel like there's a lot of arrogance in science a lot of people who are entrenched in their own opinions and outlooks on what the universe could be or should be such as when we search for extraterrestrial life, we always do so from the 
from the zero point that it has to be oh carbon based and it has to exist in this Goldilocks zone of you know liquid water and well by yeah. definition of it being alien it probably doesn't right hmm. because the conditions for our for Earth and life are probably inhospitable to another alien species out there that might right. be the 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 chains that build up their structures. If they're even made up of structures, imagine that. It could be sulfur based. Who the hell knows? They could be metallic, you know. That. Um. So his ability to do that, I, I was very uh, refreshing. What were your thoughts on him never dis- actually like physically describing what any of the alien races look like? Did you? I think. Did, did, I mean, they were you disappointed or you like. No, that, no, 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 not at all. I think that was a great way of uh, leaving it leaving it up to the imagination of the reader because if he was to do so then he kind of locks himself into um whatever limitations of those descriptions are right so say that they're humanoid of a sense right say the trisolarans are humanoid right and then he locks himself into being oh then they have to be carbon based oh and then the dehydration thing kind of doesn't work out you you know what i mean right 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 so if there's some things he leaves vague, then he gives himself, or any author would give themselves more latitude um, in making their story more plausible. Plus, it's cool not to have it, not have every little thing dictated to you. Right. <laughs> um, so some of the, the more um, like high-minded scientific chapters, I'm thinking like specifically like Project Sofan chapter or the part where they enter the four-dimensional pockets. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when I first read them, I had to like go immediately go back and reread them because I was like, "What right. are they talking about?" <laughs> like, what did, I mean, how was your experience reading those like super scientific um, chapters? Yeah, I did the same thing. You were you, you're thrown aback, and they kind of hit you out of the blue, right? Um, right. You got to go back reread them. Something I do, I did with a few of them was, so the none of these are really. Um, ideas or concepts that he invented they kind of already exist in science or they they have a theoretical footprint so to help me better understand them i would look at clips of movies or tv shows or 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 read excerpts from other books that describe similar things Mm -hmm. um to help you better understand so when they were describing in the end of uh the first book um the unraveling the unfolding of the protons into uh, you know, two-dimensional space or whatever. Yeah. I understand it in a conceptual way, but to help really drive the point home, after I read that, I got on the computer and I looked up Carl Sagan's famous, you know, yep. uh, uh, <laughs> w- w- with the apple slice. You know, yep, a- yep. A- every sci-fi fan knows what I'm talking about. So I relied on, lent on, leaned on other things to help rationalize it to me. Yeah, I actually linked that video in, my, in the last episode. Too. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because uh, I, I did the same thing. Uh, yeah. You know, after after I read, um, I forget which where, when I did it, but I read Flatland like right after, uh, you know, or even during the series maybe because people had recommended it as like how to think about stuff in like different dimensions and like yeah, tons of videos about mm-hmm. tesseracts mm-hmm. and like higher dimensional <laughs> yep. uh, things. <laughs> the 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 scene when um the crew of Blue Space or was it Gravity? I guess it doesn't matter. They were in the uh, in the ring, I think it was called. Yeah. And they were able to see inside each other's like their organs and their insides and everything was in my mind, my mind's eye was painting like me looking at another person, but then their entire existence becoming like this fractal sort of expanding pattern where you're going through like a kaleidoscope. Yeah. And that's the visual that you're seeing, like the insides of their insides, everything just mushrooming out and i just it, you you can't visualize it because it doesn't exist and our brains exist within three-dimensional space and they're wired to only interpret the information of three-dimensional space but the best ability we can to imagine four-dimensional space i think is very well executed in those passages yeah yeah i mean the only other thing I can think of is, you know, what Interstellar tried to do at the end of it by, by showing that, but it, it came off as just silly to me. I, I, I mean, that's the one part of the movie I didn't like. Oh, when uh, Matthew McConaughey's character was falling through that library? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that... I mean, I get what they're trying to go for, but like, right, right. And it, and it's really hard, right? Like, how thought, can you do it? <laughs> I thought that was more of a 
artistic um, interpretation more than it was supposed. To. So that as far as movies go, that that was probably as hard sci-fi as it gets, especially towards right. an American audience. Yeah. Um, so I appreciated that, and I didn't really have much to many bones to pick with it, understanding that that's where it was coming from, and it helped teach millions of people around the country, perhaps around the world, um, all these concepts that they never knew about before. So I, I like that movie a lot, even with the silly little, you know, scenes like that. Yeah, that same, same. Yeah, I mean, people got super interested in black holes. And, you know, that's mm-hmm. sort of what I'm thinking. I mean, hopefully if, like, the TV show for, for Three Body and, and Remote and Zero Past, like, takes off on Netflix, like, if that really becomes popular, like, maybe, like, these concepts, philosophy, mm-hmm. um, you know, become more more interesting you know people will start getting you know being armchair physicists or whatever right yeah. um <laughs> uh so i guess do you have um like what what's your thoughts around the tv show are you apprehensive are you excited uh like w- what are you thinking there i'm actually ex- pretty excited i've been waiting for some sort of adaptation i knew these it would be adapted into something when i read these books uh three or four years ago just because mm-hmm. of the all of the attention it got at the time even yeah. within sci-fi circles. I mean, I think President Obama read it and had things right. to say about it. He's on, <laughs> so, yeah. he, he's on every book. Every, every all three books is like a quote is like, is there? <laughs> that's yeah. pretty, it's probably a later edition. I don't have those. Um, <laughs> so yeah, when it gets attention like that, then you know it's going to be made into something. Um, as for its, how its adaptation, it's being done by the guys who did Game of Thrones. You know, you know, they get a lot of bad credit for how they handle the end of the show, but they had no source material to go off of after having four seasons worth of it. Right. Um, so I don't have those same fears about this, knowing that it's completely fleshed out. In fact, there's, you know, you have the prequel. It's not really a prequel because he wrote it first with Ball Lightning. So there's a lot to go off of. Hmm. Um, so I'm not really worried about any of that. There's also that uh, fan fiction book that came out last year. I, n- I haven't read yet. Yeah, but... I haven't. Yeah, Redemption of Time. I, I haven't read it yet either. I- I've heard mixed things. So I, I, I yeah. Yeah. I On Goodreads, it's, I think it's hovering around four. So that's mm. pretty good. Um, and, and you said you had read Wandering Earth, right? No, I saw the movie. I didn't read it. Oh, okay. How, how would you think of the movie? The same. I, I, I if if I said I read it, I, I was misspeaking. Um, the, oh. the movie, <laughs> the movie was, it, it was comical. It was a bit of a, now from what I read online is that it, it's not like what the book is like. Mm-hmm. Um, the movie, you know, I, I enjoyed it for what it was. I went into it expecting uh, uh, something a bit less intense and emotionally captivating as, you know, remembrance. That's what it was. That's about it. Yeah, when when I when I watched it, like it, it I I liked it too. Um, but yeah. I, it, it it I mean like the broad like big concepts. It, it really did remind me of uh, of Leo Sishin, You know, like I mean he wrote it obviously, but like you know like you can kind of tell for me like oh they're moving the whole earth right. Yeah. <laughs> like they're you know like these kind of really big high minded scientific concepts. Like it reminded me of of his style. And like I got it. Uh, and so that's hopefully i mean that was for a chinese chinese audience not i don't think it was meant to be released you know or you know to be it was released in u.s but it wasn't mm-hmm. you know wasn't like a mass market thing right um no so, i i saw it at a uh an, an independent theater so it wasn't like you know in every amc or whatever yeah i i saw it in, well i live in uh, los angeles and they have like a big chinese community here and right. i saw it it's like when those, those chinese communities it was like subtitled in english but it's like you know in the you know in chinese I always prefer watching uh, a foreign entertainment in their native language as it's produced uh, because you get you, 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 the voice, uh, the emotions in the voice, the inflections, um, all the little nuanced things that you're not going to get in a dubbed version. Mm. Um, so I don't mind reading the subtitles for a couple hours or an hour and a half. You know, It just helps yeah. you pay better attention, in my opinion. Um, so are there, are there, I mean, you you'd mentioned a couple of books at the, the start um, that you're that they'd recommended any other things that you're looking to read or you know not even books but like tv shows movies that people who like this series would also like when i'm thinking of space and tv shows and entertainment i'm, I'm trying to think of things people haven't seen <laughs> i'm watching oh. the ex- i'm watching the expanse right now on amazon yeah. and i think that's a pretty good take on yeah. a, a pretty realistic take on what intrastellar society would be like where it's all humans just spread out in different parts of the uh, solar system and they're limited yeah. and what their limitations are um, i absolutely cannot stand um the space genre 
or or works within the space genre that violate FTL, faster than light travel, hmm. um, that rely on hyperspace, that rely on all these tropes to push the narrative um, that are just full of deus ex machina. Um, hmm. They're pretty stale to me, and I try to avoid them. Now, with that being said, um, there's this old real-time strategy game for the PC called Homeworld that I'm a huge fan of. Um, mm. And hi- hyperspace travel is a key concept within it. But because you know I started playing it when I was very young, that like, gets <laughs> like kind of an exception to me. <laughs> uh, sure, sure. I, I like the next generation Star Trek. Um, I don't know why I like it. <laughs> Is that also a childhood? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's. Yeah. I think that's just something you know. You grew up watching young, and it's a nostalgia bug more than sure. anything else. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> some something I wanted to talk about about the book was the examination of society. Um, yeah. It, I think it's yeah super interesting. It, it perhaps it rivals that of the science within the book. It, it, it's a sociology test in many ways and how he yeah. goes goes about describing uh people's the collective consciousness of the world shifting so many times in the same story um yeah from uh from when she sent out the first signal and all the 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 fear and paranoia to where the uh the eto was created and you had your adventists who are just basically this big suicide cult it's like go jump off a cliff already man be done with it <laughs> well, you gotta wait 400 years uh the, you had the redemptionists who who i guess they wanted to use the trisolarans as a means to uh, uh reform earth right and i guess the survivors who were kind of just like the the uh the caveman cult who are like yeah they'll come here and conquer us and we'll just live like in our tunnels or whatever um, yeah. And then it went from that to this, and, and then after um, we started developing our science, and it looked more and more like we were capable of taking the fight to the Trisolarans, you had a growing thread of of um, hatred towards uh, people who wanted to escape, people who, um, yeah. who, who were cowardice, um, and then it shifted again towards oh when the bronze age came back and they wanted to try all of those people from right. the um from the fight yeah they tricked them all to say oh come back yeah home. yeah <laughs> <laughs> such a dirty move and then yeah. ag- and then again they wanted to to try luoji for blowing up that other star it's all coming back to me in drips and drabs i'm sorry um oh, that's right. it's a lot <laughs> it is a lot yeah how how I don't, I don't know if you edit, you know, naughty words, but how fucking stupid is that of these people? Like, he's the reason why you're still alive right now. Uh, right. Uh, he's the reason why humanity knows of the dark forest theory, and now you want to put him on trial because he blew up another star that you do or don't know that other uh, civilization was on. Right, right. And then again, it shifted once more once we understood that we couldn't escape the foil attack. And then as um, AA and uh, Sheng were leaving, he had, <laughs> I remember that one paragraph where they were getting radio and transmission, radio transmissions from other ships saying, take them out. They can't escape. Nobody can escape. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we all go down together. Yeah. It's just depending on the circumstances of what's going on in people's lives, you know, humans are just so fickle, so you can't determine you you can't depend on on a on a singular mindset and 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 use that to build a society and in contrast to that that's exactly what the trisolarans depended on um i remember when i remember reading the guy who uh was manning the outpost on trisolar on on mm-hmm. uh, sorry the trisolaris the listener. yeah the listener yeah. And he came back to his uh, his king or his whatever they called him precept. Princeps. 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 Yeah. And the leader was like, "Yeah, these emotions, these fickle little feelings. We tried that in the past, but it didn't work out. So now right. we're just 100% uh, a pragmatic utilitarian species, and uh, 
all emotion will be taken out of everything because we've realized that uh, we're worse for it. Yeah, they're singularly focused on getting off of Trash Solaris. Like that's the only that's the only important thing because they know it's like not you know not right not long for for surviving. So they have to like yeah. Their material conditions depends on that. And I guess yeah. I guess that you know uh, I'm coming to this realization right now as we talk, and it makes sense for Earth to be different because we're in such a stable you know yeah. little little planet in our little pocket of the galaxy that doesn't see get get much action. So we kind of we have the luxury of being of emotional species evolving because we don't have to worry about the material needs of of water and and heat right. and radiation and all those things that all these other species have to not only survive in but try to escape themselves out of otherwise they'll be destroyed I think there's also like a recurring theme of of human arrogance as well, you know. Oh, like in the first in, in the first book, you know, Ye Wen Jie and they in the the Chinese government just send messages out, be like, of course, like we're like the dominant society, mm -hmm. so you know, mm -hmm. we want someone to help us. And then you know later on, uh, you know, the arrogance before the droplet attack, like, oh no problem, we're the events two hundred years, we got it. no problem. <laughs> we got a little fusion uh, drive now. We're cool. we're cool. Yeah, and then after that, you know, after they they know that the that the attack is maybe incoming, they go, okay, well, let's build bunkers on the other side of Jupiter. It, it's fine. It, it, nothing can hurt us now. We're blocked from the sun. So like, there's like always mm -hmm. like these like you know, yeah, you know, peaks of of human arrogance and like, and then the sudden realization like, oh no, <laughs> I guess like the I guess we can't defend from these the these things these unknown things. Yeah, you know, for for a brief moment, they had uh, the reader um feeling like they were going to survive the little photoid attack yeah yeah uh, and then he hits you with the uh, oh you, you thought it was going to be a space missile <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a sheet of paper <laughs> uh, yeah yeah just a sheet of just a playing card that's what i had in my mind i had like the ace of spades just like flowing through space <laughs> i i think the only character who had it all figured out what was uh Zhang Beihai. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, what a, a lot of people call the fifth wall facer. Because he was the only one to not only have the dark force, or, you know, looking back on it now, the reader can assume he had the dark force theory figured out, which is why he hightailed it the hell on out of there. But mm. it, <laughs> he, apprent he pretended to be a loyalist while the whole time being an escapist. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think the ship he was on was the ship that seeded those other planets that AA and Shang got to in the end? Uh, I, I think his his ship was destroyed when they had the Battle of Darkness, right? But the it was those three ships, like the mm -hmm. there there those two ships that are chasing after him, and then they got into the, the then they realized that they're in the darkness, mm. and then they had to like fight for resources basically. And I, I think oh, he was that's taken right. out, but like I, the. Uh, I forget. I don't think the entire crew was destroyed, but he's definitely. Or I don't know if the whole ship was destroyed because they wanted different parts, right? But right, yeah, right. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's that ship, but yeah, he was part of that whole that whole deal. <laughs> okay. Well, either way, he had it figured out. <laughs> and totally, that's... and he's 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 the one that that caused the the because remember they had the argument about the different kind of drives. Right. And he shot the other people at the, the How meteor. Cool was that? He he, he yeah. went he went to the little pawn shop or, or the uh, the Yeah. the memento shop, bought the right. meteorite fragments and created bullets out of them so nobody would yeah. know that it was <laughs> Right. So yeah, like, they, yeah, they killed all the scientists who wanted to do like the old school um kind of uh, propulsion. <laughs> yeah, let me put this diesel engine on my ship and expect right. <laughs> 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 what, what could go wrong oh that's another thing in space sci-fi that i absolutely hate where we encounter some alien species they reach us and we have any chance at all it's like just yeah. by virtue of them getting to us it's already game over <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the trisolarans coming here 400 years and everyone thought you know it was all peachy because we had some underground cities and some spaceships right. Just the, just the arrogance captured. Yeah, it's just a droplet. Like, what can yeah. a droplet do? <laughs> what kind of little... How cool was that scene? Oh, Where it was all just yeah. one homogenous mo molecule? Yeah. Oh, the, the strong interaction um, yeah, force, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. metal or whatever it was, <laughs> material. I thought yeah. that 
Maybe, I still think, but I haven't seen any more information on it either way. Um, so at the end of the first book, when they're, when they're um, unfolding the proton, mm -hmm. and they describe it as a, uh, as a perfect sphere, that's mirror-like, I thought mm -hmm. that that eventually became so fun. I thought that that was the material that they made the droplet out of. Could be. I, I think I do remember them talking about strong, strong interaction material in another place, but I can't remember exactly where. Something but I gotta... may, that might have been it something to keep an eye out on a second read and that's the beauty of a second read because now you know the significance of the things you might have glossed over mm -hmm. or not comprehended the first time around yeah when i've been doing the rereading for this podcast like every time i encounter anything that like mentions dimensionality like i always like highlight it like oh yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> like especially in like the three body problem i'll talk about dimensionality and like is he setting it up like either so fun or the two-dimensional attack or what, the, like but there's mm -hmm. like a strong current of dimensionality um theme throughout the entire uh entire series mm -hmm. i put little post-its on the, on the margins for the significant mm -hmm. I think that's one one benefit of ebooks is like it's really easy to uh, to highlight and make notes on without reading your book, <laughs> <laughs> and it's also easy to search too because there's been multiple times where I had to search for some term that I've been looking for. That's like, right. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that is something that's I, I've noticed is you, you lose in audiobooks is you can't like control F or even with the physical book like if you have an idea of where something is you can quickly scroll to it or flip to right. it. You kind of lose that with the audio. I, I was going to say that something just popped into my head. Earlier, I said that my favorite scene was when they handed over the the um, the button for the sword project mm -hmm. um, with the sword holder. And I would like to amend that and say that my 1A <laughs> favorite moment <laughs> was in the first book, the uh, the flag scene when they were making the um, the computer. The, uh, oh, yeah, the, definitely. The von Neumann machine or the, whatever it was. Yeah. That, that that was just if you don't have a computer science background that is a great way of teaching basic basic concepts of how microarchitecture works to someone and as something with a computer science background like I, it even it, it's like oh man i studied this stuff in school like i know like what they're doing and why mm -hmm. they're doing it so like that that's like it's pretty early, early on in the, in the in the book, and that's like one of the big moments that sticks out to me too. It's like, oh yeah, like the human computer scene. And for I don't know, I want to say about three quarters or two thirds of that book, you had no idea what the significance of any of this was. You're like Einstein. Yeah. What is he doing? <laughs> I thought that was a little bit silly actually when I first read it. Um, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, you you understand later on that you know, the game is just a propaganda machine for recruiting people. Right. So they're going to use historical figures. And then it's just like, when it all hits you, it hits you. And not many yeah. books hit me like that anymore. One thing I didn't catch on the first read, or even until the last time I read it, was that um, the the historical context actually changes after he changes the screen name. So when he first starts, he has a Chinese uh, screen name. Mm -hmm. And then that's why he encounters um, some of the Chinese historical figures. Ah. Uh, and then as soon as he changes to Copernicus, then he starts encountering you know Newton and Einstein and von Neumann. Yeah. I, I, I never put that together. That that That's a great catch. Wow, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, I I didn't catch it the first like two times I read it either, and I was like, mm. oh, I get it now, because like I think that you've mentioned it, like, oh, you have, you know, your name is Copernicus, so we're gonna, you know, talk to, you know, talk to people you you might have mm -hmm. a frame of reference for, because that's the whole point of the game, like you said, it's just a propaganda, like a recruiting tool for the ETO to find like-minded people. See who the um see who the masochists in society are, <laughs> and, and bring them in. And then if you remember like the scene where the first meetup, they actually kicks people out, like saying like, oh, you're, you know, because the people like kind of talk back or whatever. And like, yeah, they'd say, oh, you're not right for us. Like, you, you can leave and your right contract will be deleted. Yeah. You you don't demonstrate unyielding uh, uh, devotion to our cause. So right. any any dissenting views, <laughs> get the hell out of yeah. here. <laughs> and I, I, I think that's pretty pretty darn apt when you uh, juxtapose it to the opening of the book and the Cultural Revolution in, in um, communist China in the 60s, where it's like just anyone who at all had any sort of thing to say about Mao or, or where he was taking the country after the revolution succeeded about 15 years prior, yeah. you were either killed or if you were lucky, you were chopping up rocks. <laughs> right yeah sent to the countryside to yeah, educate yeah, yourself in the re-indoctrination camps yeah 
and that's sort of how the story started. Yeah, yeah that that part was, was also really interesting to me when I read it, like the kind of open acknowledgement of the evils of the Cultural Revolution. But talking to some Chinese people, you know, afterwards, they said like it's kind of like an open. It's not like it's something that Chinese government tries to hide. Like they do other things currently. Right. Like there's an open acknowledgement by the Chinese government that it was a bad period in history, and you know the Chinese government has made reparations for it, which I didn't know when I read this book. It was more like, whoa, the Chinese author is talking about like the bad part of uh, of Chinese uh, the Chinese government. It was it's very surprising to me. If you put yourself in the shoes of a uh, CCP minister, right? You kind of can't deny it, or you can't not acknowledge it because. It was everywhere. Everyone has a living memory of it. It affected everyone. It's not like, you know, some of the other controversies where you can, you know, either doctor footage or pretend it doesn't exist or come up with all these other narratives. So instead of making a fool of yourself and saying, oh, it blown out of proportion, yeah, you have to own up to it in the same way that, you know, in America, you know, in primary school around here, primary school in America, you don't deny slavery. You don't deny the Trail of Tears. Yeah, you acknowledge it, but you don't really do anything about it either. <laughs> yeah, it happened. It was bad. And uh, next topic. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was kind of leading me to something else I wanted to talk about, about Ye Win Jae, um, mm -hmm. where I feel like, so yeah, she's a criminal. What she did was bad. But, you know, but... That being said, she only delayed the inevitable, right? considering the reckless way in which humans were sending out signals into space like it was no big deal. Eventually, as our technology improved and we would discover a way to send gravitational waves or higher or higher powered EM waves or neutrino waves at some point, we were eventually going to get found out and blown up. Right. And then the, the scale of the of the books, you know, the, the time scale of the books, like, it doesn't really matter. Like, if it was, you know, a couple, like, tw mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years later, because, you know, the book goes on to billions of years later. So, yeah. Exactly. And she and I imagine that Singer's race is kind of the apex predator of the Milky Way, or at least that's the way it's portrayed. Cause... It seemed like there was a whole bunch of those kind of people. Like, I, it, like that's the impression I got, that, like, they were just one of the races who were, like, more, more cleansing. Um, I their... thought that, too. But then I also consider that S Singer is the name of the character himself. I, I just mm -hmm. call the rest of them Singers. <laughs> right. Just yeah. a way to easily um, identify them. So anyway, I think the lax nature that the Singers seem to exist in, the kind of cavalier, you know, whatever, go ahead and do it sort of attitude makes me think that they're top dog. And they don't yeah. have they don't have to worry about anyone else because they already took out everyone else or anyone else who right. would challenge them. So like, yeah, we can lay back and I don't have to blow them up today, maybe tomorrow, but I'll get around to it. And I feel yeah. like if you were like middle management in the Milky Way, you wouldn't be that that lax about it. You would, yeah. you you would be on top of it, or you wouldn't be sending anything out there. Yeah, I think one of the things that I would have liked to have seen expanded, um, you know, in the or the, seen a little bit more about was like when the when they actually got to Planet Blue and they t they talk about like all the wars that are happening and like mm -hmm. how it's really taboo to talk about your location, um, and then like it, yeah, it's just like kind of a, a battlefield out there. I would have liked to seen a little bit more about that, um, yeah, because of that, just to get a little bit more context around the universe. Yeah, part of me feels like so <laughs> from the point when the two of them escaped the solar system to the end of the book. You could create another book out of just that chapter. Totally. <laughs> and he abbreviated it and he accelerated the time so much. And I think he was, just, part of me thinks like he was kind of burnt out and he wanted to get to the end. <laughs> um, and he didn't want to hash out this whole new narrative and conflict after the fact or after the uh, foil attack. Hmm. So that's why he kind of did it very quickly. Yeah. Um. So yeah, if if that one chapter can be its own book, I think that's some grade A content right there. Totally. I I don't know if like Redemption of Time is about that. I remember hearing it something to do with Yuan Tin Bing, and I I don't know. Uh, maybe they do expand on it. Yeah, I'm totally blind. Your guess is as good as mine, but that that would be very <laughs> cool. 
um maybe the new pocket universe they uh started oh yeah so as it regards the pocket universes sisson eventually after writing three grim books that have a very pessimistic outlook on the universe and the fate of the universe at the very end he kind of tries to undo all of that by suggesting that no the prisoner's dilemma and game theory you could throw that all out the window because everyone who hid themselves in their pocket universe that they, they'll all give their matter back <laughs> and i thought <laughs> uh, and part of me wanted to pretend i didn't read that i was like so you wrote the three books for nothing <laughs> like what is it what is the underlying emotional uh, a feeling you're trying to drive home here that because I, I feel like you can't have it both ways. Either yeah. the dark dark forest theory and, you know, game theory, uh, berserker theory, as it's called, either that's all true or it's not. And we're all benevolent and we'll all do the right thing, quote unquote, right thing in the end. I guess it wasn't clear that, I, I mean, I think they even said like, well, maybe not, not everyone will do it, but hopefully enough people will do it. And Chung Chien kind of just took it as like a, a faith that people would do it, but maybe they didn't, right? Like, we don't know what happened. Uh, you know, it could be that, you know, she did it, but then, you know, they they live on their, the on Planet Blue until they die. But, oh yeah, m maybe they didn't, right? Yeah, and I interpret it in a way because of the conservation of mass slash energy that mm -hmm. if only a single one didn't give back even a single gluon it, it right. wouldn't work because it has to be equal in the end and right. if a single she, speck of matter is missing <laughs> yeah she left a fish so is she, she screwed it up again <laughs> so is she going to return to a universe that doesn't exist she's going to open up the door into nothing that, I, I don't know okay uh, well mm -hmm. did you have anything else you want to discuss no i think we got to everything um i I, I enjoyed having this conversation. It really helped me reappreciate all the things I may have missed and all these perspectives that I didn't consider before, like like in the uh, VR with the name he chose. Um, and I really enjoyed talking with you. Great. Yeah, same. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you uh, for joining us. And uh, how can people uh, find and contact you online? If, if you liked what you heard from me, you uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter. My handle is um, at a y y y y t e n a 10 <laughs> that's my last name um and i'd mm. love to hear from you yep i'll link it in the in the show notes so again thank you very much i appreciate your time all right thank you very much if you would like to participate in an upcoming interview please feel free to contact us at rehydrate at fastmail.com or on twitter at rehydratepod. pod <laughs>